But welcome everybody to today's webinar highlighting how political and economic developments, cyber breaches, COVID, and other global events are influencing policy, markets, and risk. I'm your host, Leo Gonzalez, Senior Trainer at NFP. Should you have any questions during this call, please submit them using the Q&A functions on your Zoom menu bar located at the bottom of your screen. We'll compile those questions there and then answer as many as possible at the end of today's call. At this time, I'd like to turn the call over to Mike James, EVP and Head of Individual Solutions, as well as today's call moderator to introduce our guest speaker and kick off the call. Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you, Leo, and welcome to everybody worldwide here at NFP. I'm so humbled and honored to be your moderator for today's call. I wanna welcome everybody and our esteemed guest, Admiral James Stavridis. The Admiral is a former NATO Supreme Allied Commander and a current member of NFP's Board of Directors. He is also Vice Chair of Global Affairs at the Carlisle Group and Chairman of the Board at the Rockefeller Foundation. Few have the access and insights that the Admiral has. He is often referred to as a Renaissance Admiral for the depth and breadth of his understanding of everything from cybersecurity, military strategy, character, and leadership. He has published hundreds of articles in leading publications and 10 books including his most recent New York Times bestseller, 2034, a novel of the next World War. World War. On behalf of NFP, we appreciate his time today and look forward to his insights. Admiral, I now turn the call over to you. Hey, thanks, Mike. And, uh, you know, Mike, James, MJ, as I always say, uh, you know, an admiral is good, but if you have a side order of MJ, you're in pretty good shape around the NFP world. <laughs> and so I'm very proud to be uh, a board member at NFP and to be part of this call. So thanks for a very gracious and kind introduction, MJ. Thank you. Admiral. Well, listen, as advertised, we're going to talk about geopolitics the leadership challenges that the Biden administration is facing. And hopefully from that as investors, you'll come away with a sense of risk and opportunity because there's both out there. Well, let, let's start on the risk side of the equation. One obviously needs no introduction, if you will. Um, now look at that photograph. Now you're probably thinking, okay, that's one of those pop-up hospitals, uh, you know, maybe in Central Park from a year ago or maybe it's more recently with the current spike uh, with the Delta variant. No, this photograph was taken over a hundred years ago. This is during the time of Spanish influenza, which afflicted the world uh, in the period right after World War I, 1918 to 1925. I put it here to remind us that we've been here before. We, the world, we've been through pandemics. They occur every 100 to 200 years. Unfortunately, as the world's population grows and as we urbanize and populate the same spaces, they're going to increase. But fundamentally, the pandemic of 2020, 2021 has been a terrible event. We have seen similar ones before. We will get through it, keep it in perspective, part of the message. So that was kind of 2020 number one concern. Well, number two, I don't need to tell an investment call, was the impact of the pandemic on what before that was a pretty strong global economy. Went down in almost every place. It's come back pretty sharply in China. It's coming back sector by sector in the industrial world. Uh, the developing world still has some challenges ahead of it. So challenge one, is the pandemic. Challenge two is the economy. And challenge three, here I particularly speak to the Americans in the crowd, we've had a change of administration in the United States. So whether you're politically on the right or the left, you have to recognize that anytime you bring in a new team, a new cast of characters, you're going to have challenges. So pandemic, economy, new administration. So Right about now, you ought to say, well, okay, Admiral, um, what do you think? What are the implications of that trio of significant uh, muscle movements in 2020, continuing on into 2021, of course? Uh, where do you think it's all going? 
So let me start with a nation that has come out of the blocks very strong from the pandemic, and that would be China. Why? First of all, because using, shall we say, authoritarian tools not readily available to the United States and to other nations, China was able to quickly surmount the pandemic. They're dealing with some secondary bounces now, but they've come out economically more quickly than any other developed nation has. And that's given them a real bounce in their step. And they're using that bounce to energize their ongoing global strategy, which is called One Belt, One Road. Sometimes you see it abbreviated as uh, BRI, uh, Belt Road Initiative. The idea is quite simple. It's elegant and it's smart. It is a strategy that says, okay, we're going to create manufactured products in our factories, and then we are going to ship them out along these roads, along these paths, to the north, the old Marco Polo Silk Road, to the south, the maritime routes. Um, as those goods go out, you create geopolitical influence along the path, raw materials come flowing back. It's a mercantile strategy, geoeconomic strategy, and again, it's clever and it's capable. They have a couple of elements to it that are important. One is cyber. China is, along with the United States and Russia, leading actor in the cyber world, particularly good at using their cyber capabilities for industrial espionage, conventional state-on-state -state espionage. Um, they were recently accused by the Biden administration of using cyber to undermine Microsoft Exchange servers. This is the so-called hafnium hack. This is a real capability that China's working hard to develop, and it's part of their strategy. A second fundamental element to be aware of with China and its strategy is this, the South China Sea. Now, you're familiar generally with that area of the world. You may not realize that area, the South China Sea, is vast. It's half the size of the continental United States of America, so a, a huge swath of territory. And China essentially claims territorial control out to that red dashed line that you see there. That's a big claim. And they want it because under that water surface are huge deposits of oil and natural gas. And also because 40% of the world's shipping passes through that region. It's geopolitically very important. So China will continue to press on these claims. And in order to strengthen those claims in the South China Sea, upper left, you'll see them build artificial islands. Again, this is clever geopolitics. In that red area, China has built uh, seven to nine of these artificial islands. Upper right is what they look like at the start. They're sand that's dredged up from the bottom of the ocean. At the bottom is what they look like when they're finished. They have airstrips, missiles, radars, tanks, troops. China then claims a 200 mile exclusive economic zone around each one of these artificial islands. Again, it's a very clever way to reinforce their claims. So Belt and Road Initiative, cyber a significant part. The key is the uh, trade activities, mercantile, also geopolitical influence in the South China Sea. Another element of Belt and Road is to gather a growing relationship with Russia. Um, here, bottom left, you see, for example, the largest military exercise conducted in the world since the end of the Cold War was on the Siberian border. Those are Russian and Chinese troops hugging each other. Bottom right, you see a Chinese frigate and a Russian destroyer operating together, not where you might expect it, in the North Pacific, but rather in the Baltic Sea, photograph taken a few weeks ago. And by the way, they were joined on those exercises by an Iranian frigate. So expanding diplomatic relationships, particularly with Russia, is part of Belt and Road. And unfortunately, the United States and China 
have a significant basket of disagreements. Upper left, cyber, I mentioned, upper right, China's expansive military buildup. This may surprise you. Today, China has more warships than the United States of America, about 360. We have about 300 of these warships. Ours are bigger, more capable, nuclear powered, but quantity has a quality all its own. We're gonna see that Chinese fleet bumping up against the US fleet in the South China Sea in the decade ahead. Bottom right, trade and tariff disagreements are right where they were under the Trump administration, no big changes. And bottom left, I mentioned these artificial islands. In the center, I put the 5G logo simply to remind us that tech and China's push to control tech and in particular building the 5G networks globally, Huawei is the forerunner of this, uh, is gonna be a point of disagreement with the United States. So how's it gonna come out? Well, it might work out reasonably well between the United States and China. Look closely at this photograph. This is a Chinese warship, except look in the upper left. You see a US flag flying there. Look in the crowd on the bottom right. You see both Chinese and American flags. This is the visit of a Chinese warship to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. We may find our way over the course of this decade to a comfortable relationship with China. On the other hand, as MJ mentioned a moment ago, I've written a novel, a cautionary tale about what a war with China would look like. You see the cover in the upper right, 2034, a novel of the next world war. How that pair of alternatives comes out will depend on our diplomacy, our strategy, our military capability to create deterrence. This relationship, US-China, has a great deal of risk built into it. Well, how about Europe, our greatest pool of partners and friends? Europe uh, has now, I think, finally uh, concluded the Brexit situation. That's good in the sense that it will allow the European Union to put more attention on global issues, questions, and concerns. It gives Great Britain more latitude and maneuver. Um, both will continue to be strong allies and partners of the United States, despite the fact that with 28 different nations in the European Union, you're going to see disagreements, protests, different levels of engagement globally. One bit of glue that kind of holds it all together, the United Kingdom, European Union, United States, of course, is this, NATO, where I served as Supreme Allied Commander. NATO will continue in relevance even as it steps back from its mission in Afghanistan. There's plenty for NATO to do in deterring Russia, looking to the north in the Arctic, working on migration streams from the south. Uh, NATO will be fundamental to how Europe works alongside the United States. I'm cautiously optimistic here. Let's turn to the developing world as we come out of COVID, or perhaps as we come to the realization that we're gonna be living with COVID and subsequent variants for quite some time to come, unfortunately. In all three major developing world areas, so that would be India and Pakistan, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Latin America and the Caribbean. These three regions are half of the world's population, 3.5 billion. What they have in common, unfortunately, is that they have very low levels of vaccination. They have limited access to the vaccine. They have uneven systems of governance. All of that will create real discontinuities in their economies over the next one, two, three years, perhaps. Um, it would be smart on the part of the developed world to get the vaccine moving. You're seeing the United States do some work here. Some other nations are helping, but the faster we can stabilize these medical situations in the world to the South, the better. Here's the good news. These are young populations. They are more resilient to COVID than the older populations in the US and Europe, for example. So it's a mixed picture but look for drag in the economies in all three areas. And by the way, speaking of Latin America and the Caribbean, close to home, here in the Caribbean, we have seen just in the last couple of weeks, 
real political instability, both in Haiti, upper left, where president was assassinated, and in Cuba, bottom right, where we've seen the largest protests since the Castro's left power. Um, in both cases, COVID has played a significant role here in the dissatisfaction of the populations. And as you look back, not only in Latin America, not only in the Caribbean, you, you see this playing out in Brazil, in Colombia, in uh, Peru. Um, you see it in Sub-Saharan Africa, in South Africa, great dissatisfaction in Nigeria, in, in India and Pakistan. So throughout the developing world, this problem of COVID will create more political risk affecting investment potentials there as well. Russia will continue to simply be a spoiler in international relations. Its economy will continue to be a one trick pony, two tricks if you count gas and oil and watch for Putin to create difficulties but be drawn into the orbit of Beijing. Well, how about this basket, the Middle East, and here I'll include Afghanistan is really part of South Asia, but this whole uh, situation that we see with Iran uh, ought to continue to concern us. There's both hope and there's reason for concern with Iran having uh, been kicked out of the Iranian nuclear accord or more, more accurately, the United States leaving it and freezing it. Uh, Iran and the United States are in a negotiation to put it back in place. It's a very flawed agreement. It's almost at its term limits already. Um, I think it's a 50-50 shot, whether that will come back or not. And here's the real problem. A hard line administration was just elected in Tehran. I'm gonna put more sand in the gears. At the end of the day, however, I would bet we'll probably see some kind of agreement because the Iranians wanna get out from under sanctions. The US uh, wants to put a win diplomatically look for that to occur perhaps by the end of the year after the UN uh, events in September. And then finally in the region, our greatest partner and ally and friend is Israel. We have close relationships with Saudi Arabia. Um, all of this will play in a, in a very confused space in the Middle East. Um, step one to watch for as investors is, will an agreement be reached between the United States and Iran? If so, by the end of this year, I think the opportunities for investment look better here. You know, North Korea, <clears throat> always want to mention them. Uh, tensions are actually coming down a bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tensions are actually coming down a bit on the peninsula between North and South Korea. So um, at the moment, I don't predict an outburst. Um, let's let this one play out. Um, in the end, this is very sublimated to overall U.S.-Chinese relationships. How about here in the United States? Our, our politics continue to be that of discord and disagreement. And unfortunately, even today, we see testimony on the Hill concerning the events of the 6th of January. <clears throat> I don't see that changing in the immediate future, unfortunately. It will handicap us globally as other nations become less confident in our ability to participate globally. Finally, in terms of risk, I have to mention cyber. Uh, as many of you know, I gave a, a distinct presentation for NFP about a year ago on cyber. Across the top here, you see three significant risks. Hackivism, upper left, in the center, cyber criminal activity, somewhere between one 1.5 trillion dollars of cyber criminal activity annually, and then national level cyber risk, China and Russia most notably. Um, lights are blinking red light right now. If you look back, I mentioned the hafnium hack before that, the solar winds hack before that, Russian interference in our election. This is going to continue to be a very central political risk, not going away. If you're investing, you want to be thinking about protecting your portfolio companies, certainly your own company, and you're also thinking investment opportunity in this space um, as federal government, for example, begins to mandate certain standards of cybersecurity going forward. 
And then lastly, in terms of risk, a little bit longer term, but impact on today's investments, environmental. And we see this playing out in my native state of Florida, um, hurricanes coming with more regularity, brush fires in the West, the ice is melting in the North. Um, you know, this is going to come home to roost about mid-century or so, but it's one of these problems from hell that if you wait until the moment when, okay, now it's a crisis, you can't solve it. You have to begin earlier. And this is something that I think um, is going to have to be baked into uh, political risk calculations. This drives many security concerns, including drought, flooding, all the things I mentioned, as well as investment opportunities on the side of uh, technologies and methodologies to ameliorate these kind of concerns. So <clears throat> that's a, a fairly long way of saying uh, the Biden administration, any administration would have its work cut out for it, uh, political disagreements, an ongoing pandemic, the economy feels like it's doing well, but we ought to be worried about inflation. We ought to be worried about um, developing markets to the South. Um, there's plenty to be concerned about. Uh, so what are the tools that you're gonna see the Biden administration use as they come at some of the challenges we've discussed? It's a good team um, in, in the sense, again, I'm apolitical. Uh, I was vetted for vice president by Hillary Clinton. I was offered a cabinet post by Donald Trump. I think of that, by the way, as kind of two bullets whizzing by my head at some point. But I will tell you that I know every one of the people in the uh, Biden administration quite well from my time as Supreme Allied Commander. Here's the good news. They are very experienced. Everybody is in the job that they were one below last time. Vice President Biden is now President Biden. Deputy Secretary of State Tony Blinken is now Secretary of State Blinken. Upper left, if you don't recognize him, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan was the deputy. Bottom left, my good friend and contemporary, General Lloyd Austin, West Point graduate. Other than that, a very good guy. Uh, Lloyd Austin was General Austin. Now he's Secretary of Defense Austin. We all know Janet Yellen. In the bottom center is Avril Haynes. Uh, now the director of national intelligence. She was the deputy at the CIA. So very experienced team. Secondly, very collegial team. They like each other. They work together very well. They're kind of out of the Obama, no drama, Obama school of governance. And again, I say all this not as a political judgment, but as a practical one in governance. It's a team that works together pretty well. I think they're going to be surprisingly innovative. And you know, the, the rap on this team is, oh, it's just, you know, the Obama folks come back. I don't see it that way. Um, they, like anybody, and you all know this in your own lives, when you've been number two or number three in an organization, and then you're entrusted with a leadership role, what you want to do is come up with some new ideas. You don't want to just ride on the laurels of your predecessor. Nobody does that. And I think you're going to see this team pursue innovation. You're seeing it right now in the way they're driving at the, the challenges, which are immense, of this second wave uh, in the pandemic. We've learned a lot, the big we, all of us, about, um, about how to create these vaccines. We still need to learn about how to get people to take them. Um, you're going to see, I think, more innovation coming in the days ahead in that regard, because that's the path out of this. And you're going to see a lot of innovation. I'm already seeing it in the defense space. For those of you who are interested in investing in this area, this team wants to push to the new in defense. And that means artificial intelligence, unmanned vehicles, hypersonics, special forces. That's a Navy SEAL trident on the left. Space, huge growth area. Look for this administration to, to push in all those zones. And also telemedicine, teleeducation, what we're doing right now, work from home. Point being, this is a team that has a lot of green space in terms of innovation. I think they'll use it quite cleverly going forward. Secondly, I think the Biden administration uh, has its work cut out for it here in communication. Not thinking of 
communication is just a megaphone from the White House, but really inculcating this idea of communication as a bridge. It's got a, a receive and a transmit side. You cross the bridge back and forth. They're going to have to do that. Uh, they've got work to do. And I think particularly in this world, now you're looking at that and you're thinking, okay, he's a retired admiral. Uh, what are these shipping lanes? No. Airline routes? No. Fiber optic cables under the ocean carrying the internet? No. Good guess. There's too many. Only about 300 cables carry the entire internet. This is Facebook. The world according to Facebook, the brighter the white, the higher the concentration of Facebook users that tell if you're a poker player is that China is dark because they want all that social data because that data is oil to them. It's what drives machine learning. It drives artificial intelligence. Point being here, Biden administration has to get into these social networks. And you know, the bad news here is our opponents are here already. I'm showing you the mechanisms by which Russia undermines our democratic elections, by which China creates influence globally, by which the Islamic State recruits, proselytizes, conducts operations. And, you know, sometimes I'll say all this and people say, oh, Admiral, you're right. It's a war of ideas. Not quite. It's a marketplace of ideas. We got to compete. And our ideas, they're called our values. They're the right ones. Democracy, liberty, freedom of speech, freedom of press, gender equality, racial equality. Look, we execute them imperfectly. I get that. But they're the right values. We got to compete. I think the Biden administration is going to push hard in this zone and they're going to need to because this is going to be a very competitive space. And then finally, as I conclude here, and we'll open it up for some questions, which uh, MJ will orchestrate. Third thing you're going to see a lot of from this Biden team, uh, and they're going to need to do this well, is collaboration. And, you know, sometimes we're in the season of the Olympics, of course. I was thinking about showing, you know, eight guys rowing in one of those Olympic uh, shells, those rowing boats. I thought, you know, that's not what real collaboration looks like. It's too perfect everybody rowing together. Real collaboration looks like this. It's messy. It's a Peloton. These young ladies are in the messiest kind of collaboration. And they're, you know, they're collaborating, they're competing, people fall down, they get back up. It's a very messy space. So if you're going to compete in that space, you have to build on the structured part, you know, the NATO, the formal alliances, you got to build coalitions. This is the coalition against the Islamic State. 77 nations are in this. I would ask, where's the coalition against COVID? Doesn't exist. This is where innovation has got to be part of how the administration approaches its challenges. And then finally, this administration will want to use these international organizations. This is a real distinction between the Trump team and the Biden team. From the Trump team, they walked away from these. Uh, the Biden team embraces them. Uh, how I score them, I kind of think of them like those Chevys driving around Havana Harbor. Uh, they're, you know, they're old. They were built in the 50s. They could use some paint. They could use maybe a new engine, but they're still on the road. And I think the point here is you want to use these institutions, but you want to recognize their limitations as well you know, see paragraph one about maybe we need some new coalitions if we're going to deal with these challenges. Hopefully that's where you'll see this team go. I mentioned values before. All this has to rest on a bedrock of values. And I wouldn't underestimate it. You know that I'm Greek, so I'm required in every presentation to have a Greek myth. Most of you will recognize Sisyphus. Most of you will know what happens when Sisyphus gets the boulder to the top of the mountain, it rolls back down. Uh, having spent uh, my later years at the highest levels of the US government as Supreme Allied Commander, Commander US Southern Command, Latin America and the Caribbean, Chief of Staff to the Secretary of Defense, Don Rumsfeld, I can tell you the boulder always rolls back down. That's true for the Obama administration, the Bush administration, was true for the Trump administration. This boulder will roll back down on the Biden team as well. The measure of any 
person and the measure of any government is whether or not they have the resilience to keep rolling it up. And then lastly, before I hand it off to MJ, they got to move at speed. We do not have time here. And time is not our friend. We've got to accelerate, but we got to do it in a way that keeps the system in balance. That's going to be the central challenge for the Biden administration. There are 60, 180 days, six months into this, um, many challenges ahead. I've outlined a few of them. Uh, let's give them time, recognizing they've got to move at speed. All of that will create real political risk, but opportunity as well. So with that, I will uh, say thank you for having me. Here are my coordinates uh, on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. If we don't get to your question in the next half hour, MJ assures me he'll figure out a clever way to get me the question, or you can just hit me here uh, at any of those social networks. With that, <laughs> my friend, Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, Admiral, you're the best. Thank you so much. Uh, your insights were beyond informative. Um, we at the NFP family are so proud to uh, have such a great relationship with you. And thank you for that okay. session. So we do have a fair amount of questions. So let's get right into it. And first, let me just say, we've gotten lots of notes just thanking you for your insights and your time. I think, you know, uh, people are, are looking at different mediums and trying to put the picture together. And I think you painted an incredible picture today that people can relate to. And it was in, in relatable terms and they know kind of where we stand in the country and in the world. So here's the first question from Henry Preston. Uh, Henry says, Admiral, you written before that the U.S. Uh, must build a partnership with Russia. Do you still believe this is feas a feasible option given China's growing relationship with Putin? If so, what avenues do you see leading uh, to a successful relationship? Henry, that's the right question to ask. And um, let me start by saying, uh, as Russia and China draw closer together, uh, my message to Vladimir Putin would be, be careful, Mr. President Putin. Um, think about this, Henry, Siberia, just to the north of China, it's a vast land area, Siberia. This is Russia to the east of the Ural Mountains. It's the size of the continental United States. Nobody lives there, like 20 million people in an area the size of the continental United States. What's in it? Oil, gas, timber, arable land, fresh water, gold, diamonds, rare earths. China looks at that like my dog looks at a ribeye steak. It looks really good to the mm -hmm. Chinese. Putin, you better be careful. That line of argument is one way we can perhaps pull at Comrade Putin a bit. But I call him Comrade Putin because he is an unreconstructed uh, follower of the Soviet Union. He has said publicly the greatest tragedy of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. Really? More than World War I, 20 million dead. World War II, 60 million dead. The Holocaust, 8 million dead. The worst tragedy was the collapse of a dictatorship? I don't think so. Putin, however, believes that. And so, Henry, I don't think we're going to establish a, a partnership with Russia. But here's what we can do. We can recognize that we have zones of confrontation with Russia, cyber, their interference in our elections, their support for war criminal Assad in Syria, their invasion of Ukraine. These are real, true confrontations. We're going to have to continue to confront Russia. But there are zones of cooperation. And that's really the back end where you ask, what avenues are there for a successful relationship? won't be an alliance, won't be a partnership, doubt it'll be a friendship, but we can pursue work together uh, on environmental issues. We can, both, both nations have an interest here. We can work together with them on global energy. Both nations are two of the three largest energy producers in the world. We can work together with Russia, I think over time on the Arctic, where both are Arctic nations Neither has an interest in militarizing it. So there are zones of cooperation. So bottom line, Henry, we should confront Russia where we must. We should cooperate where we can. 
it, it will be a transactional relationship at best. Hopefully, President Putin will wake up to the fact that he is, would say in the Navy, standing into danger, in my view, in this relationship with China. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Admiral. Let me just also say, Admiral, it, it, it's great to hear commentary that's balanced. I think the audience, you know, we're all looking for what are we doing right? And, and I just appreciate the way you've answered um, that question. Um, here's another question. And this is from Chen Wei Wong, and hopefully I pronounced everything right. Uh, good morning, Admiral. Retired Chief Petty Officer Chen Wei Wong. Thank you for your time today. You mentioned early in your presentation that the United States might be able to coexist with China uh, as, as time goes on. Do you believe that China could be trusted to uphold any potential economic or trade agreement given their aggressive military stance with the, uh, in the Spratly Islands and an accelerated presence uh, from an economic investment and political influence perspective? Well, I love the question. Uh, thank you for your service in the Navy shipmate, as we would say. Uh, and by the way, uh, Chief Petty Officer Wong, just to show you that I have skin in this game, my daughter, Christina Stavridis, is married to Jimmy Wong, who is a proud Chinese American, just like you. And uh, he's first generation a medical doctor. So I have two little grands who are Wongs. So I, my cup runneth over with Wongs. And I appreciate uh, this merger of Greek and Chinese uh, culture. I always say it's kind of like my big fat Greek wedding meets the last emperor. That was what my daughter's <laughs> wedding looked like. Um, let me say that um, I, I think um, it, it's unlikely that China will trust the United States, and it's unlikely the United States will trust China. Therefore, what we need to think through, uh, Chief, is how we avoid breaking this relationship and ending up in a war. And what I mean by that is we got we to gotta bend the contour of this relationship. We're just not going to, I say this to another sailor, we're just not going to tell China, oh, it's okay, you can own the South China Sea, half the size of the United States, let alone the Spratly Islands, which are a tiny part of it. We're not going to do that. These are high seas. These are international waters. Um, we're not going to accept China saying, oh, uh, we want full access to the U.S. markets, but we're going to highly restrict any U.S. access to our markets. That's just not going to work. So we, we got to bend the relationship but we got to be careful we don't break it and end up in a war along the lines of the book I wrote, 2034. So how do we do that? I'd say we create a strategy, and that's what's been lacking so far, Chief. We have had some episodic interaction with China over the years. We've never had a coherent whole-of-government strategy that combines strong military capable diplomacy, building alliances with Australia, Japan, NATO to balance China, India's critical economic balance between our economies, cultural balance, calling out human rights violations, but recognizing China is a sovereign state. And finally, uh, tech. Tech is going to be a big part of this. So point being, we need a coherent strategy to approach China recognizing this is not going to be a relationship built on fundamental trust, but rather it's going to be built on incentives, disincentives that are going to flow both ways. I think we can do this. I would start by bringing together our nation's experts in all the areas I mentioned and create a coherent strategy. Um, I, I'll close by saying President Biden has appointed in the White House as the head of the National Security Council, the entire Asia portfolio is a man named Kurt Campbell, who I've known for decades. He's thoughtful, he's smart, he understands the, the, the totality of this relationship. We're gonna have to get this right, uh, Chief Wong, uh, or the consequences globally are immense. And for Chinese Americans like you and my son-in-law and my grandchildren, they are equally immense and dangerous. We got to get this one right. We need a strategy. 
Thanks, Admiral. We're going to keep moving around the world. Another question came in from Maria. Uh, thank you, Admiral, for sharing your insights with us again. I'm a big fan. I'm Cuban born American. Where do you see the U.S. and Cuba relations going in the near future? Well, as, as you well know, and, and of course, I'm an enormous uh, part of the greater South Florida community, having been born there <clears throat> and having uh, learned to speak Spanish in La Calle de Miami, um, knowing uh, Calle Ocho extremely well. Oh, yeah. um, I, think, I think I understand the question. Um, you know, you're in a good position to have observed the, <clears throat> the way the Cuban-American community itself is evolving its views on Cuba. Uh, and there's discussion about an approach to Cuba that's both incentivizing and uh, using disincentives. So I think that's probably about right. You need a balance between those two. So, <clears throat> excuse me. In the wake of these protests, Maria, um, which are quite significant, as you well know, I think the United States ought to lean in with very strong sanctions applied to senior Cubans individually going after offshore bank accounts, going after individual members of the security forces. Um, that's the disincentive, the stick, if you will. The carrot side of this could be a limited return to some level of sanction relief <clears throat> that would make sense. Perhaps not all the way back to what the Obama administration put in place, but opening communication channels, giving a little taste of the carrot, even as you bring the stick into place. Um, I'll close by saying, I think that uh, the regime is under stress right now. And therefore, uh, the administration ought to be looking very carefully at what its options are. Um, and I think a mixed bag that uses both sticks and carrots right now is the correct prescription. Um, we ought to, I'll close with this, we ought to recognize that um, the Castro brothers are gone, but the new group is just as, as lethal, just as much a group of dictators and are highly unlikely to have uh, a sudden epiphany that opens the island. I wish that were the case. Uh, more likely, we're going to need the kinds of things I talked about to move forward. Gracias. Admiral, we're going to keep moving around the world. One more question on, on the world stage. And then we've got a couple others uh, in some other categories we'd like to get to before our allotted time ends. Um, will the withdrawal of troops in Afghanistan and Iraq see another rise of bad actors such as ISIS and the Taliban, leading to an increase in tensions in the Middle East and abroad. That came in from Robert. Hey, Robert. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very concerned about this withdrawal from Afghanistan. And I, I think it's a mistake. And, and let me sketch it this way. When I commanded that mission as Supreme Allied Commander in NATO, most of you will know it was a NATO mission. We had 150,000 troops there. By the time President Biden took office, we were down to 3,000 U.S. troops. And by the way, we had 7,000 Europeans there. So we weren't even in the majority on this mission. I think that small level of, uh, of, of deployed troops is entirely sustainable. To put it in perspective, we have 50,000 troops in Europe. We have 35,000 troops in South Korea. We have 15,000 troops and sailors in Japan. So keeping 3,000 troops in Afghanistan, <clears throat> in my view, would have made a lot of sense. The president's made that decision. That ship has sailed. It's certainly within his authority. There are arguments to do so, you know, longest war, et cetera. By the way, we have not had a combat death in Afghanistan in over a year. So this was not even a force at significant risk. Having said that, uh, the question is, your question, what will happen now? I think, um, I'll give you the hopeful side first. I think there's a one in three chance that the Afghan government, if the US and the allies support them from over the horizon, no boots on the ground, but airstrikes, intelligence, logistics, resources, salaries to pay the 
Afghan fighters. And this is not a lot of money in the big scheme of things, tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the Department of Defense budget. If we provide that, I think there's a one in three chance um, the Taliban will ultimately come to the table and agree to a power sharing agreement. That's the best course. Unfortunately, your question, I think there's a two in three chance the wheels are going to come off here like it did in Vietnam in 1975, like it did in 1991 in Afghanistan when the Soviets cut off assistance to the Afghan security forces. If that happens, two in three chance, yes. I think the concern will be an ungoverned space, Taliban, a civil war, uh, nature abhors a vacuum. I could see a world in which terrorists, particularly Al-Qaeda, Islamic State, as you point out, um, re-enter that space. I don't think it'll be the Taliban as follows. The Taliban are consumed with creating their idea of a caliphate inside Afghanistan. They would like nothing better than this, the world to go away and let them drag Afghan society back to the ninth century. We shouldn't do that either, but I don't see the Taliban themselves as a terrorist threat. I do see them permitting Al-Qaeda to come back. And frankly, that's where this all started just about exactly 20 years ago on 9-11. So what we ought to do in order to maximize the chances of the one in three good outcome is support the Afghans from over the horizon, diplomatically, economically. The Biden team has said they're going to do that. I still think it's a very risky proposition. Um, and so let us, let us hope for the Afghans, because at the end of the day, the United States, if things go badly, will walk away. That's not the right outcome for Afghanistan. And if it comes back to strike us as terrorists, we will rue the day we did not leave that small troop presence in place. Thank you. Thanks for that answer, Admiral. Um, so we're gonna shift gears just to balance out the Q&A a little bit. I know we're kind of running thin on time, but uh, a good friend, Eric Pakros, has a great question. From what I understand, the cost to launch a cyber attack is far less than the cost to defend against cyber attack. Would it ever make sense for the U.S. to go on offense so that China has to commit resources to defending itself, or perhaps is this already happening? Um, Eric, you are absolutely spot on. So uh, just to get everyone on the same sheet of music, cyber has a defensive side where you protect your networks, and within those networks, you effectively inoculate yourself against intrusion. So you wanna have a perimeter defense, but I would argue more importantly, you want to be able to have antibodies inside your system that can find and neutralize what gets in. It's a lot like biology, right? Um, you know, there's an external defense from pathogens, including masks, but once they're inside you, they're inside you and you better have antibodies inside. So that's, cyber defense. We are very good at that, but as you can see from solar winds, hafnium attack, etc., nobody's perfect. And as we expand the internet of things and increase all that threat surface, people may not realize this, there are 7 billion people on the planet Earth, 25 billion devices are connected to the internet. Every one of them is a threat surface. So as we expand that, as the internet of things gets bigger, that defensive problem is gonna get worse. Over here is offense. That's the ability to do exactly the opposite, to intrude on others' networks. And once you break through, you then have some choices. You can simply listen and extract information. You can manipulate data. You can destroy data or threaten to destroy data called ransomware, of course. You can conduct activities that have kinetic effect. In other words, you can manipulate cyber in order to open a dam and flood a city. You can poison a water source. We've seen attempts to do this. You can do society busting measures like take down an electric grid. We've seen that in Ukraine by the Russians. So the offensive side is very, very real. Do we have those capabilities and tools? Yes, here I need to be careful of classification. 
but I think you can find open source discussions of this by leading uh, practitioners. Um, we are very good, both defensive and offense. I would argue when you combine those two as a metric, we're the best. Russia, particularly strong on offensive means, less capable on defense. China, pretty good at both. U.S., I'd score at U.S., China, Russia, top three. Then you get down to the next tier, United Kingdom, Germany, quite good at much of this. Israel, excellent. Uh, your point, you don't have to be a big nation to have these capabilities. So bottom line, you got to do both. You can't just defend. Uh, you've got to have the ability to go on offense where it is warranted in response to attacks. I, for one, am an advocate of responding. Bullies only recognize when you strength and come back against them. And you've seen this recently. I'm going to guess here. Um, after the recent solar winds hacks, um, suddenly Bitcoin started to disappear from people's accounts. Suddenly, poof, uh, one of these groups disappears from the internet. I am not going to stipulate that that's a result of US activity, but I hope it is. And finally, if we're going to create deterrence in this world, we're going to need to demonstrate the offensive ability. And here the parallel, Eric, is with nuclear weapons. Um, thank God we haven't seen the use of a nuclear weapon in the world since Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of the Second World War. Why is that? It's not because we have perfect defenses against nuclear weapons. We do not. The reason we have not seen nuclear weapons used is because of deterrence, because of mutual assured destruction, because a sense that Russia has that if they attack us with strategic nuclear weapons, we will respond massively. That is kind of apocalypse now, uh, but it, it has a chilling effect on nations desire to use nuclear weapons. Cyber is approaching that level of capability. And I predict over this coming decade, you'll see the US, China, and Russia engaging in conversations, not only about strategic arms limitation that is for nuclear weapons, but also for cyber. That's a growth area. It's one we need to focus on. I think we got time for one more. Yeah, Admiral, I got, I got one more for you. And then I, I just wanna ask in advance that as you wrap your comments, if you would give kind of uh, the sound bites for your, your book. We've gotten several questions that I think would give away things in the book if we <laughs> asked, if we put them to you here. So we're gonna deal with those offline. But if you would close with any commentary on the book, it would be great. But here's the question from David. What do you think the long range effect of debt to GNP will be? Yeah, this is a, a gut question. And of course it gets into the concerns we ought to have tactically about inflation. But I think your question is poised strategically, as in, um, as we are loading debt onto the US economy, what's the long-term impact of that? I'm cautiously optimistic here. I think that our economy, if we continue to grow it, can sustain this. Um, having said that, if we mismanage events going forward, uh, long term, we're going to have not only inflationary impact, but we're going to have a significant, uh, if you will, misery index uh, to include both uh, the inflation side of the account and uh, higher interest rates in order to sustain and pay for that debt. So there's a watch out there. But the good news is our economy is big. Um, our, our workforce is relatively young and immigration helps us. This is where I would be very worried if I were China long-term, the effects of their demographic uh, downward spiral and lack of migration, immigration uh, will hurt them. So put me down as cautiously optimistic, uh, but uh, this is something that, um, that the, the Fed is gonna be watching closely but what I don't think is we don't need a kind of a draconian 
let's suddenly decide we're just going to balance the budget. I think, as always, we can apply common sense here. The choices are not simply load debt on the economy and hope everything comes out well, or uh, put a balanced budget amendment in the Constitution. The right answer is kind of in the middle. And, and if you, you think of it as a like one of those old fashioned steam calliopes, it's got a lot of valves. You got to kind of adjust the valves. And part of that means you probably raise retirement rates a bit, take pressure off social security. You probably take defense spending, maybe take it down a little bit. You know, we're spending a huge amount of money. Um, you know, all of this is risk based. You look at some measures that constrain some aspects of federal government growth and you put it all together, hit the valves, you're probably going to come out okay here. If you want to look at a product that does that, go back to the Simpson Bowles report of, um, gosh, 15 years ago now, which came up with a pretty reasonable plan that balanced uh, across time and uh, attack the debt challenges that we face. So uh, with that, MJ, um, I'm happy to say a word about 2034, a novel of the next world war. And so it's a book set in the year 2034. It postulates a decade from now to then where the United States doesn't embrace its allies. It falls behind China in artificial intelligence and cyber. China becomes more muscular the two nations collide in a dispute in the South China Sea. Over time, that ladder of escalation unfolds. Pretty soon, nuclear weapons, not strategic, but tactical nuclear weapons are in use. And I'll, I'll close with a teaser, which is that India, India plays a very surprising role in the novel. Set in 2034, I wrote it as a cautionary tale to make the point that if we don't avoid stumbling into a war with China, both nations will be very diminished. We can avoid that. We need to read the book and reverse engineer ourselves to the present and try and avoid that war for the sake of Chief Wong, my son-in-law, Jimmy Wong, and all the people of China and all the people of the United States. Michael, thank you. It's been great being with you. Thank you, Admiral. You are the best. We are all so much better for your insights and your partnership with NFB. We can't thank you enough. We're glad you're on our team. Um, <laughs> lastly, I just want to thank my colleagues around the world for tuning in. I want to thank every client that took the time to be on this call today, every center of influence and affiliate with the organization. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Continue to be safe where you are. And until next time, thank you. Thanks, everybody. That concludes our webinar. We'll distribute the call recording within the next few days. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Have a great day.